I believe that God calls us in this moment to be wounded healers and to be what Jesus called peacemakers. Would you notice with me the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 9, which records the words of the Lord, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. You need to know that word peacemaker is loaded. I don't know what you think of when you hear it. Some people think of a soft or gentle or kind-hearted Mr. Rogers type of individual who really doesn't have any convictions on anything, just willing to roll over and uh, just concede to someone whose wishes might be greater than theirs. Kind of a, a picture of peace at any price. I just need peace. But that person is not a peacemaker, that is a peacekeeper. Their goal is to bring, not to bring two sides together, but rather just to keep the two sides from killing each other. I'm sure as Bishop and the leaders are in Israel, they will travel to the north and they will come to the border of Syria where we stood in our trip to Israel and overlooking the border of Israel and Syria, standing alongside the United Nations peacekeeping forces. The peacekeeping forces do not carry guns. They carry binoculars. Their only job is to observe the conflict and to try to speak some kind of peace into the negotiations. A truce that is declared, it basically says, okay, where it's not really peace, it's just we're not going to shoot at each other for a while. It can happen in marriages. A husband and a wife might not be fighting, but it doesn't mean necessarily that they're living in peace. They could have just called a ceasefire while they give each other the silent treatment, find time to reload <laughs> for the next skirmish or the next event. Jesus is not talking about people who are peacekeepers. He's talking about people who are peacemakers. Peacemakers. Now, when we go into the scripture and we discover this word peace, we find that it comes in three different arenas or three different areas that the Bible makes very clear to us. The first of which is this idea of having peace with God having peace with God. This is the vertical aspect of our peace process. The scripture in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. The word makes it clear that outside of the saving work of Jesus, Men, women, children are at odds with God. In fact, they are separated from the promises and the covenants of God, and in their own power, they possess no way to reconcile themselves. If you glance down at Romans 5 and look at verse number 6, it says, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice those words that are used there. We were sinners, we were ungodly, and we were powerless to do anything about our situation. There was no way we could be reconciled to God unless God did the reconciling. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, God saved us by grace to himself. As Paul would say in Colossians in chapter 1, God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once we were alienated from God, we were enemies in our minds toward him, 
but now he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death that we might be presented holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If we continue in our faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope that is held out in the gospel. My point in showing you these scriptures is the fact that peacemaking is God's work. God made peace with us. There was nothing we could have done. We were alienated, separated. But God took the initiative to make peace with us. So much so that the words of the psalmist in Psalm 85.10 are fulfilled at Mount Calvary. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other at the cross. It is there that the words of Isaiah 53 are fulfilled. That he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. This is peace with God. This is the starting place. Without peace with God, we do not understand the, the fact that all other peace is nailed to that vertical beam. Unless I have peace with God, I can never be a peacemaker bringing peace into the world. It starts with coming to Christ. It starts with opening my heart to the saving message of the gospel and allowing him to bring me who was at enmity with God to peace with him. You'll be restless until you rest in the Lord. The second peace, however, moves us further into the word of God. There is not only peace with God, but there is what the scriptures call peace from God. Jesus himself spoke these words in John and chapter 16. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In John 14 and verse number 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. The fulfillment of Isaiah 50 or 26 and verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. See, once I have experienced peace with God, I now begin to experience peace from God. I begin to have in my life a peace that passes all understanding. I look at the letters of the Apostle Paul. Thirteen of them begin with these words, Grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace from God. You can only receive those that kind of peace if you are at peace with God. Where there is no separation between you and him. Where your life is open before him so that he can make his rich deposits in your life. And now that I am at peace with God and have peace from God, it is my call to bring that peace to others in the world. In fact, Paul writes it this way in Romans 12 and verse 18. He says, if it is possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, I would say, and you would probably affirm, that while you might have it in your heart to be at peace with everyone, everyone doesn't have it in their heart to be at peace with you. But as far as it lies in you, who have come to know peace with God and peace from God, live at peace with all men. The, uh, David, the psalmist, said it this way in Psalm 120. He said, I'm a man of peace, but when I speak peace, they are for war. And we realize that this is the way of the world. This is where we live. It's the culture in which we find ourselves. Instead of peacemakers, there are peace breakers. Those who break down relationships. Those who stir up strife, causing trouble, delighting in division, looking to try to just eliminate any unity there is in this world. Turning children against children, children against parents, brothers against sisters, husbands against wives, bosses against employees, players against coaches, nations, tribes, races, and people. Instead of being peacemakers, they are peace 
breakers, full of making trouble. Workplace, controversy, family, church, uh, agitators, instigators, dissidents, malcontents, spark plugs who just like to set something off. You understand. They're not looking for peace in the earth. And so God says, I have set my children in the world to be just the opposite. Where they want to start an argument, I want my children to seek an agreement. Where they want to just trouble the waters, I want you to speak peace to the waters. Where they want to raise issues, I want you to be able to solve issues and bring kingdom solutions to a world that is so terribly divided. Where they want to set fires, I'm calling you to stop fires and be a peacemaker in the earth. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through your whole spirit, soul, and body. He, the, the scripture tells us, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the one who calls you to this is faithful and he will do it. How many know he's the God of peace? Do you notice that? He's the God of peace. Bishop Reed often tells the story of how he... His vision was that God was angry at the world and that if God could have his way, he would destroy the world until one day he had that life-transforming vision that set the course of his life from that day forward that instead of God crushing the earth, he saw the broken heart in the earth and realized that God wanted to bring healing to this world. And that's our mission in this hour, especially church, peace with God needs to translate to peace from God, and then it needs to go to the peace of God. The peace of God. May I share this with you? The peace of God is not something that you experience individually. The peace of God is spoken of corporately in the Bible. The peace of God is that which governs and rules his church. Let me give you an illustration. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And watch this now. And the, not the peace, not peace with God, and not peace from God, but the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Please notice the plural will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. If you glance up at the beginning of this chapter, chapter 4 and verse 1, you will see that it is a corporate word. It is not an individual word. He says, Therefore, my brothers, of whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. He's speaking to us corporately. Uh, you have to understand that the peace of God is something that umpires among us. It is something that dwells among us. It is that Psalm 133 blessing of God's shalom over us that we all walk in the peace of God. I've had in my life of ministry, and I'm sure you have as well, individuals who, um, forgive me, the spit is anointed. Anyway, um, anyway. Anyway, I, uh, I have had people who have done things totally contrary to the revealed will of God, totally outside of what God says, to the chagrin of everybody around them, saying, how can you do this? How can you violate this? How can you take that step? And they answer with this, well, I have peace about it. I have peace about it. No, 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 the question isn't do you have peace about it. The question is do we have peace about it. The question is, is does the, the peace of God generate in each of our hearts over the direction that you are heading? Have you ever had to deal with this? Because it says in the book of Colossians 3 and 18, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There it is, peace of Christ. Rule in your hearts since you are members of one body. You were called to peace. So we understand there is peace with God and peace from God. But the peace of God, that which rules in our midst, is that which we are to take outside of these doors to everyone everywhere. How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news, proclaiming peace 
and good tidings and salvation who say to Zion, your God reigns. Notice the link between the peace of God and the reign of God. The reason Jesus speaks these words about peacemaking, if you know the scripture in the Beatitudes, he starts with the phrase, not blessed are the peacemakers, but he starts with blessed are the pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's Matthew 5 and verse 8. Then he says in Matthew 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the sons of God. It's important to note the order. First there is purity, and then there is peace. We find the same in the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, and then peace-loving. So our peaceableness is never a treaty with sin. Our, our, our reaching out to someone is never at a compromise of our, of our walk with God and our holy position in the kingdom, but it is one of an extension of grace and mercy like we were extended. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Please notice there is an order to those words, righteousness, peace, and joy. Some people want to have joy, but they've never experienced peace. And you can't have peace until you have righteousness. When there is righteousness, then there is peace, and then there is joy in the Holy Spirit. You and I have to set our faces as flint to deal with the things that are contrary to God's will. Obviously, once purity has been a settled matter in our soul, then we can go forward to the mission of peaceableness. Then we begin to take this word. Whatever we have learned or received or heard we, or seen in these great apostles, we put into practice and the God of peace is with us. I remember trying to get into the kingdom of God and I couldn't get in. Do you know that? You say, Jim, you were born in a suit. No, I was born in sin. And I lived an unrighteous life for many years. I was so desperate in sin that I tried to join a cult and they wouldn't let me in. Now, you got to be pretty bad when you can't even get into a cult. But there was a cult in my neighborhood, in my town, and I tried to join them, and they said, you're just too messed up. You'll mess us up. We don't need you. And they took, I'll never forget the man taking a handkerchief out of his pocket and saying, you're worse than what's on this. You're wretched. You're miserable. You're, you're, you have no value. But thanks be to God, there was somebody else who didn't compromise with my sin, who didn't, you know, take down any barrier, but, but built a bridge to me and reached out to me to say, you know what? There's room for you in this kingdom. Jesus is a great Savior. You could know him. And I was thinking I had to get my life all fixed up and made up for him, but I didn't find that that way. Even while I was dead in trespasses and sins, while I was a sinner, while I was ungodly, while I was unclean, he loved me and gave himself for me. You know why we're called sons of God? We are called sons of God because when we make peace with people, we are like him. Did you see that scripture? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now, ladies, don't, don't cringe over that. If I could be called the bride of Christ, you can be a son, okay? All right? So you're a son. That's an image. It's a picture that you have the Father's heart. And so if, if, if God is reach to me, and I am like him. God is the great reconciler. I am not in this moment looking for ways to polarize the world. I'm not looking for ways to push people away from the kingdom of God. Without compromising our values and our heart, I'm looking for ways to extend my hand, being salt and light, and being a peacemaker to a world, and especially a nation, that is divided. God, help us in this hour to be a reconciler and to take the message of the gospel to as many as we possibly can. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are his ambassadors. 
not promoting what we think is right and what our, what our program is, but taking who we know is true and who we know is right and bringing him to the nation so that healing can come once again to our great land. I, I challenge you, look at what you're saying. Think about through a different lens than how it appears to you. And consider your brothers and sisters in Christ. Consider those in your neighborhood. Consider those in your community. Consider those in your workplace. There was a day when Jesus said to his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, Jesus, truthfully, people are pretty confused. Some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah or one of the prophets. In other words, you're not coming across very clearly right now, Lord. And I want to say to you, you might think you're coming across one way, but you may be being perceived in a whole other way. If we're going to be perceived in this hour, let us be perceived as peacemakers who are extending a hand of love and grace to a world and to a nation and to some friends and maybe even some enemies who need to be reconciled to you and reconciled to God. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? And could we pray? This is a morning of healing. Could we pray for a divided nation right now? God, give us sensitivity. Give us an understanding. Help us to see what others see when they look at us. We think we're coming across so clearly. But God, we know we need discernment. We need restraint. We need conviction. We need truth. We need you. And so come and visit us as your church. Let us be a church of bridge builders. Let us be a church of reconcilers. Let us be a church with its hands extended out to every race, to every people, to every tribe, and to every tongue. Let us be a people that reach outside these walls and take the message of peace with God and peace of God into this nation as never before. We pray not only for us as a community of faith, but we pray for your bride, your church in the earth today. Make us a shining witness of your love. Take us in this hour, Jesus, and make us a bride that you are proud of. One who speaks your truth without compromise, but reaches its heart and its hands to all those that are in need. And Father, I pray that we truly will be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah.